I did want to uh, take a little bit of time here and introduce uh, a wonderful guest here who's going to come and dazzle us with detail in 2022, what this means for you and for all of us. So, uh, so you have a proper census to uh, our speaker. I wanted to wanted to read out his, his bio and then, and, and then get started and hopefully as you're going through, think of some great questions to ask uh, at the end of his presentation as well. So, Marshall Film Chief Industry Analyst at NPE Group Inc. is a nationally known expert on consumer behavior in the retail industry. He has followed retail trends for more than 30 years at NPE and is the head of leading fashion and apparel manufacturers as well as major retailers. Marshall is the author of two books, Why Customers Do What They Do in 2006 and Why Me, How to Get Customers to Choose Your Products and Ignore the Rest in 2010. In addition to his duties at NPD, Marshall is currently a member of several boards of directors and has most recently been appointed to the Cutler Board and American Apparel and Cutler Association. He is also a guest professor at North Carolina State University School of Textiles. Marshall has been a guest lecturer at the Wharton School of Business, Fashion Institute of Technology, and Savannah College of Art and Design. Marshall is also a regular contributor to many major media outlets. He is frequently quoted in publications like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Women's Wear Daily. And additionally, he appears on various television news programs, including Today, Good Morning America, CBS Sunday Morning, and has been a regular guest on Bloomberg TV and Radio. So can we give him a warm welcome? Thank you very much. Um, what I want you to do today is just listen. Open your mind. What I want to do is share with you a lot of different things that are going on across the world of retail, across the branding business, and, and as consumers, we need to recognize things have changed. We need the retail and manufacturing world to catch up to us. We've already changed. They need to change along with us. So you'll see as I go through this, you'll find all kinds of different industries and different ways to sit there and recognize how we can do some of these things. I'm also going to talk about where you fit in and how important your role is going to be as we move forward. Just so you know where I get my information, so you don't just think I'm another one of these people who come in and just make up all this stuff, I don't. I spend a lot of time in stores, I spend a lot of time interviewing consumers. We get information from 87% of all the retailers in the United States and many across the world. We have over 10 million people that are part of our consumer panel. We go out to 2 million of them every year. We get a, a new product we have which is called Checkout, where we, we have harvesting of the receipts. So your actual receipt that you have, people send in to us, and we can learn all different kinds of things from that. And I'll share some of that information with you. All right? And then the other side of the question is what I do. I have to go out and try to figure out what, what the world is doing and how do all this data fit into a story? So we'll go through this and you'll get an idea of what's going on. So let me give you the bigger picture. This is the boring part. This is where all the numbers come in and how businesses are doing. But I'll try to make it not so boring, all right? When you look at all the different things that are going on, these are all the challenges that retailers and brands face today. I'm not going to go through all these. We'll go through a bunch of them. But there's plenty of them and, and you get the idea. When you look at business today, retail today, Prestige Beauty, for the third year running, is the best and healthiest business. And there's a reason for it. The reason why beauty's doing so well is they figured out how to resonate with the consumer. Two years ago, it was all about fragrance. A year, before, a year after that, last year, it was all about uh, skin care. And this past year, it was all about makeup. Getting ready for that selfie moment, right? And you can sit there and see, it's, while it's not the biggest business, it's got the biggest growth rate. When you look at the cross support, I'm not going to go through these, you can see toys doing well because of innovation and great products with licensing partnerships. And then you have the housewares business, which figured out how to change that dynamic by taking 10 pots and pans out of a box and selling as individual pieces. They finally figured out, after 20 years of doing that, that maybe not everybody has to go buy 10 pots and pans every time they need a new pan. So, wow, what a revelation, all right? And this actually came, I remember talking with one major retailer, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but they have a big red circle and a dot in the middle. And I said to them, why do you only sell 10 and 20 pieces sets? 
So it got people thinking, and we looked at numbers, and that's how you help retailers figure out how to grow their business. All right? What's interesting is look across the board to see fashion business, like apparel, running flat, no growth. Footwear, down 4.4%. That's because you guys aren't going out and buying enough sneakers. That's really the answer. I'll, I'll show you that later. All right? And the accessory business, of all the businesses, how is it possible that the accessory business, the most logical thing for us to want to buy, is not doing well at all? And we'll share with you why and how. All right. When you look at what's going on, just from a trend line, you can sit there and see, this is why you hear in the news that retail is doomed and gloomed. It's destined to disappear. Stores are closing left and right. There's not going to be any retail stores. I remember somebody else who I was doing a presentation with once came on, you know, after I spoke, and the guy sits there and he goes, this was seven years ago. He said, retail's going to be out of business in three years. Do the math. He's wrong. Retail isn't going away. It's changing. It's up to us to figure out how to work with those changes. So when you look at these trend lines, take out the grocery, I mean the restaurant business, and you can see the trend line's a little bit worse. But it's really about looking at that little tail there at the last bit of the last half of the year. You can sit there and see in those last six months, the tail isn't get dropping as much. It's starting to level up. That's good news. And the reason why I say that is when you look at online, just look at how online is doing. Yeah, sure, online is doing better. What's interesting is when you look at online, the more mature categories, more mature industries, are the ones that aren't doing as well. So consumer technology, which has been selling online for 14 years, well, they're not growing at the same rate. They're not growing as fast as they used to. Footwear, remember Zappos? Zappos started selling footwear online years and years, over a decade ago, and everybody said, who's going to buy footwear online? You've got to try the thing on. Well, free shipping took care of that problem. But it's really about recognizing these more mature categories and industries that have been online longer are not growing at the same rate. So you have businesses like Beauty, which was late to getting in the online game, and the restaurant business. Think about that, what's going on there. All right? There's all kinds of interesting things happening. More than 50% of restaurant business today is taken home, either ordered in to eat at home or eaten half and taken home to eat again. More than half. So when we start to think about how things are changing, here's a great example. All right. When you look at the trend line from the online market, you sit there and you see that decline is actually running at a steeper rate. So online is actually declining faster than the in-store business. That means to me that, hey, wait a minute, that means the store business is getting ready to level off, which is actually how I see it. All right, but we'll get into that. Drill down one layer further, categories within an industry. And you can sit there and see, makeup. Remember before I said the reason why beauty was doing well was fragrant skincare makeup? Well, there's the makeup. Makeup is driving the growth for the past year in the beauty business. You have things like stereo headphones and home automation. New, innovative things that are driving the market. But I'm, you know, we're hard pressed to look for products today that are so new and innovative. For holiday, the only thing that's going to be new and innovative is maybe the you know, Apple phone. Right, whether it be the A or the N. And it's really going to be an interesting dynamic because not everybody even uses that platform. Not everybody needs a new phone. And by the way, $1,000, it's a lot of money. In case you guys didn't know. But it's really about recognizing all different kinds of things. But here's what's interesting. I just mentioned before how bad footwear was. Look what's driving growth for the footwear. Inspired by basketball. Inspired by running. So think... Adidas superstars, think Stan Smith, think Puma Clyde, think Nike Cortez, all of those nice new balance. So think about all these shoes that are not necessarily being used for performance wear, but for fashion. That's what's working, but not driving the athletic footwear market. So you can sit there and see, sometimes something may get do well, and I'll show you why that doesn't always work. Something may do well, but it doesn't always drive the business. All right, let's keep going. These are the categories within the industries that stink. They stink. This is what's driving their, you know, the, back, the bottom. Tablets and e-readers. Anybody here need a new tablet, a new iPad? Anybody? No. Why would you? Unless you dropped it and broke it. Frankly, right? most of them we don't even use them anymore. We use our phone, right? They're big enough. But it's like it's obsolete. 
And they haven't done anything new or different. You still get the same lousy movies and the same lousy content and the same, you know, it's the same stuff. So that business is really struggling because they're not doing anything new and exciting. All right? You can sit there and go through the whole litany of different things. And, you know, certainly dress footwear on the bottom, towards the bottom of the list, a great example. Nobody gets dressed up anymore. So, like, why bother? All right. One of the things we have to look at is certainly e-commerce penetration. How big is the e-commerce business today in relationship to each industry? So in technology, you can sit there and see 30% of all sales in the U.S. in technology is done online. So it has 30% penetration rate. All right, And you can sit there and see, as I mentioned before, the more mature ones are the ones that have the highest level. The big question every retailer and every brand asks is, how high will they go? Will that 30% ever get to 40 or 50%? The answer is, in many industries, yes. Technology is certainly one of them. All right? So you have different things that are going on, and these numbers can vary across the board. If you just look at you know, the different businesses within these, you can sit there and see fashion has a different level. And even when you look at fashion, you can sit there and see even within that, you have seasonal basics and certainly uh, fashion sides, and these businesses are all different levels. So these are the things that brands and retailers have to figure out, wrestle with. They don't know these things. They just sit there and think it's all well, one universal number. Uh -uh. Not even close. And the next question is, which ones are going to grow and how high are they going to grow and when are they going to grow? So the light green is what's going to happen in two and a half years, and the dark green is what's going to happen within five years. So, What's interesting is we're going to be buying more than half of our underwear for the guys. We're going to be buying more than half our underwear online. And for women, you're going to be buying your internet apparel online. So the world is going to change. We know it. When you look at the different average spends, everybody sits there and talks about, oh, this is a younger market. Not really. Not at all. You can sit there and see it's pretty universal across the board when it comes to ages. And it certainly recognizes the ability to be able to understand what's happening when it comes to frequency of purchase. When Amazon goes out and offers free delivery, and next day delivery, or same day delivery in some places, why do you have to go and accumulate several things to go save on shipping? You don't. So all they're doing is driving a higher level of frequency, but a smaller amount of purchase each time. They're hurting themselves. They're driving the ability to be able to grow the business downward rather than upward. All right? When you look at what's happening in relationship to what's going on, you can see Amazon, certainly in the world of fashion, all right, has a highest level. The Nordstrom comes in second. Surprising. Most people don't think that Nordstrom.com is doing as well as it is. All right? And then you have some upstarts that have been around a while, but now they're starting to make their mark, things like Stitch Fix, that subscription model starting to work well. All right? Here's Amazon with their one-day delivery, their reach. The ability to be able to reach 43% of the population in the U.S. And they're not looking to necessarily expand that much further. They're not really going to try to have one-day or same-day delivery in Duluth, Minnesota. It's just not a big enough market for them to really drive it. So this is another reason that the internet and online selling is starting to transition, starting to slow down, starting to shift, right? Okay. The gap in this is because we changed data sources, so it really wasn't fair to compare apples to apples. So that's what that gap between 12 and 13 is. But when you look, what I really wanted you to see here is just look at that pink line on the bottom. That was online when it first started, and how it's now become the number one channel of distribution. And all the others have kind of clustered in together. So when we start to think about what's happening, it's just this blending, this melding of how consumers shop. So the world that's out there, people you know, who've been doing it for a while, like myself, are sitting there scratching our heads going, why is it so different? What do we need to do about it? That's where you guys come in. You guys come in with the fresh ideas and the fresh ability to be able to understand the perspective that we don't have. We get steeped in tradition and sometimes get lost in the ability to be able to understand that. So when we start to think about how consumers are shopping in today's world, in the online environment, you get to sit there and see, just this is just footwear. How penetrated and how different the market is. You have, you know, Nordstrom, you know, this is who Nordstrom, Nordstrom customer, where else do they shop? 
So you get to sit there and see that the world isn't the way Nordstrom, if I were to ask Nordstrom, who are your competitors, where are they shop? They wouldn't even put any of those other than Nordstrom Rack on that list. That's how blinded the market is. They don't even know their own competition. That's really where I'm trying to get it. Okay. One of my favorite slides, you can sit there and see, here's a trend that, you know, a product that hit the market and got out there. Well, there it goes. The sea of sameness. You can buy something that's similar from $700 all the way down to 20 and everywhere in between. So retailers are certainly hard pressed to try to figure out how to make that dynamic work. We also, when we look at things from a department store perspective, you have the ability to be able to see things very differently across different board. All right, this is the change versus last year in their growth factor. All right. It's about recognizing that this is happening in men's just as much as it's happening in women. I want to talk about how to look at consumer trends. Think about this one for a minute. About 14 years ago, there was somebody out there who decided to wear their pants down below their knees. And the world looked at them with amazement and said, how does that stay up? How do those people wear those jeans down all the way down there without a belt? No, how do they even walk? They couldn't figure it out. All right? And the urban or streetwear market kind of adapted into this urban market. And it took over and it was a big thing for a while. And all of a sudden, the world tried to catch up. But what happened was this trend was something that the consumer did, not manufacturers. They didn't go out, the jean makers didn't go, hey, I'm going to make these pants so you can wear them down there. No. This was a consumer that sat there the, as a group said, we're embracing this, we like this. And what changed was the brand that actually was smart was one of the underwear brands said, well, wait a minute, if these guys are going to wear their pants down there and our underwear show up, let's go take the label from the outside and put it uh, and from the inside and put it on the outside. So it was a walking billboard. And it transformed that industry. So that's a consumer born trend. And what happens is, the world doesn't understand from the retail branding perspective how to do that. They would love to create trends. It, you know, it used to be that they could, now it's really hard for them. So Superstars was a great example. This wasn't Adidas going out and telling all of you that we want you to go buy these. They didn't even recognize you even knew what they were. So you guys did your homework, found the product, and went and made it bigger than it was. The whole athleisure movement was consumer driven. This wasn't Nike and Under, Ar Under Armour saying, we're going to go dress America and make everybody look like they just came out of yoga class, even though they have no idea what a downward dog even is. <laughs> so it was really about understanding what's happening is the market is trying to catch up to what the consumer wants, right? And then it was all about recognizing you guys started something that was great. I remember teaching class a couple of years ago, and I was like, look at that. And I'm like, oh, what's with all the slippers? Everybody's wearing slippers. That's street shoes all day long, all night long. Okay? I got the young boot thing, but then the slipper thing followed right behind it. And I was like, okay, I guess that's the cooler version, not as hot, right? So that was now, all of a sudden, every slipper manufacturer is sitting saying, wait a minute, we've got to make our soles with hard bottoms, not soft bottoms. Because they're wearing his shoes, right? So that's a consumer-born trend. You get the idea. The accessory business, remember before I showed you how accessories was the absolute worst growing business? Why? Here's why. If everybody dresses the way you guys are all dressed today, all right, and let's say you were in the working world, would you really go out and carry, for God, some of the guys may not know what this is, a satchel or a tote or a clutch? Those are the dressier types of handbags at the market sells one, two, and three, the highest volume areas. The handbag business said, we're going to keep doing that. We're not going to change with the, cut, the consumer. Okay, yeah, they're wearing those, you know, those athletic inspired clothes, but we don't do that. And I kept saying to them, I remember going to coach, and I said, how crazy are you? Why would you not give the consumer what you want? You really want them to walk around with a dressy handbag? You expect them to go buy more of those when they're spending all their money on the athleisure market? And they said, oh, that's just a fad. It'll go away. Well, has it gone away? No. So they finally figured out what they needed to do is put in handbags that were more practical for our lifestyle. Over-the-shoulder bags, <laughs> what was once called panty packs, now called waist bags. And backpacks. Oh, what a novel idea. Create a dressier backpack for the consumer to feel like she's 
more supportive. Why? We want our hands free so we can continually use our phone and other electronic devices, and we just think it works better with that lifestyle. All right. The question is, how long is the active market going to continue to thrive? Well, you can sit there and see the number is starting to slow down, but that's actually price point driven. That's because it's not just Lululemon anymore. You can go to Target and get really good leggings for $39. You can go to you know, Sporting Goods or any athletic store and find a whole assortment of product that's going to be competitive. So the price actually has come down, but the units and actually the business still remain. And until something comes to replace it, this isn't going to go away. Are you really going to give up that comfort that you have and the durability and the fact that you've got stretch and, you know, it, it works. So until something replaces it, it's not going to go away. The other thing is, brands don't understand the difference between generational needs and desires for a, a trend or a lifestyle. So when you compare the use of, you know, the, the fitness business to a boomer to a millennial, it's very different. So they need these ideas to be able to be brought to them with fresh approaches and understanding. We're going to skip that. Another fun thing to take a look at is how is it possible that the watch business never figured out how to make the watch a little smarter? Why did it take Apple to come out with a really dumb smart watch? And what I mean by really dumb was it didn't really do that much. All it did was just kind of make your phone a little easier to use. And then they came out with this second generation, got a little better, but it still hasn't replaced your phone. So it's not as smart as they want us to think it is, but it'll get there. But the point I'm getting at is that, you know, Apple became the number one watch brand just because they created innovative product while the rest of the watch industry, which is a big business, did nothing. Nothing. So it's really about understanding that, you know, we're watching the consumer shift in front of our eyes. All right? We're spending more money in different ways than we've ever spent before. So you have things like concerts creating you know, record numbers of businesses, RV sales through the roof. Okay? We have you know, people traveling in different ways and doing different things than we've ever done before. Airlines create, having record numbers. All right? It wasn't an empty seat on the plane today. The other day when I was driving, I can't even move my seats anymore. It's so crowded. You know? People are begging to get on these things in the standby. So you start to sit there and see, we're doing more things than ever. We're changing the way in which we spend in a very big, different way. All right? It's also about recognizing that what's happening is we've got all kinds of things that are changing with record numbers of ticket sales and passenger counts. When you go through the airport, what do you see? You sit there and you see the ability. It's like, I feel like I'm in an Olympic arena. You know, It's like everybody's dressed for an Olympic sport just to travel. But stop and think for a second. If you're in the business of any product that has any connection or remotely needed for travel, why would you not make a product that's applicable for that? So the bag business, instead of making an open tote bag, why wouldn't you make it more of a travel bag? Get into that business. Get into that category. Start to think about doing something to help build and grow your business, whether it be footwear, whether it be bags, whether it be apparel, whether it be luggage, whatever it is. Think about how the customer lives, and that's really what you want to start to think about. Work with Lord and Taylor in doing something, and they actually took what my idea and did it even better than I thought. They partnered with Club Med, put a kiosk inside the store, and said, we're going to start to sell vacations. And around it, and here's where my idea was, it traveled so big and so important and one of the biggest growing trends in the U.S., and it's a big part of our spending dollar, and we'll talk about how that works in a minute, all right? But if it's such a big part of it, why don't we have to go to 17 different places in a store to get our travel needs taken care of? So bring all the travel product together. Here's a new, fresh idea. These retailers can't do that because they sit there and say, oh, we have department numbers and we can't cross those lines. Who said so? They said so. They've got to stop and change it. So Lord Taylor said, hey, we're going to try this. They put swimwear, luggage, travel, beauty products, accessories, all kinds of things, anything travel related, all together in one place next to the kiosk of Club Ed, and boom, unbelievable sales growth. Unbelievable sales growth, okay? So what it's doing is teaching people how to break down the barriers of traditional retail. 
it takes progressive thinking to be able to sit there and create these new ways of doing things. We've got, you've heard of vesting, and you've heard about the whole thing about spending more time and all. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but it's really about understanding that what's happening is board games are selling it, record numbers, uh, all kinds of things with the food industry, the small appliance business, all kinds of things that are going on. It's about understanding the importance of looking at changes in retail so that you can understand where the opportunities come from. Timing. When is holiday? Thanksgiving to Christmas, usually. That's how the retail world thinks of it. I say, hey, no, not at all. In fact, if you look at your phone, you probably got retail offers from your favorite retailers on November 1st, starting off with holiday sales. Black Friday deals now. So holidays already started. We're off and running. And it's really about recognizing it doesn't just end. If you look at the top five days in any industry, they're very different than each other. But retailers don't think that way. They sit there and they go, I'm out meeting with some stores next, during the, later this week, to sit there and show them just this. Here's your top five days. Here's the rest of the world's top five days. You're not even the same. Why would you think you are? So it's about, again, rethinking the equation to understand it, all right? And all kinds of gifting. You know, they don't even think of gifting as an opportunity to do it, but boy, oh boy, are there plenty of them. All right. Let's talk about what's going on from the age of population. You've heard millennial, 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 millennial. That's where all the growth is. That's where all the business is focused on. That's where every brand has to sit there and target their audience to. Wrong. It's not that they shouldn't do that. It's that that's not the only answer. By the year 2025, the biggest growth in the population is going to come from the old geezers like myself, the boomers. We're going to be, we're living longer. We're living a younger lifestyle longer. We're spending more money. We have more discretionary income. Why run away? I'm not dead yet. <laughs> that shit doesn't make me look like it to you, but I'm not. All right? And I'm spending more money than anybody who's younger than I am, so why would you ignore us? But basically, this is what the retail world, branded retailers, are saying. So I'm trying to get people to recognize, wait a minute, maybe you can do both. And in fact, maybe you need to even go one step further and look at all the different peaks and little peaks, even some of those smaller peaks, because over the next few years, those little peaks are going to be bigger. And the big peak over at the end, us older geezers, okay, I'm not going to be spending. You're going to be spending my money. So it's really about recognizing things are shifting and you've got to be able to shift with it. Don't let brands and retailers tell you that this is where our focus is. That's a major mistake. Major mistake. Okay. When we look at things like spending, you know, I used to study how consumers purchase product. What do they buy? When do they buy? Why do they buy? And I had to stop doing that. I had to change the paradigm. Even I had to change. And I had to sit there and say, I have to now look at how we spend our money, not just what we purchase. And you've all heard about experiential things. When you graduated high school, people probably asked you, hey, what do you want for graduation? A lot of you didn't say, I want a, a, a dictionary, I want luggage, I want a briefcase. You didn't even want any of them. Even if I didn't want them when I graduated. But it's really about recognizing you wanted to be able to go do something, right? You wanted to be able to create a memory. You wanted to be able to go out and do something exciting. One of the fun things to do is when I travel, I go around a lot of places. Boston, Texas, Montreal, Canada, Nashville, Tennessee, Las Vegas have one thing in common, those bachelor and bachelorette parties. Some of you may be familiar with them. Some of you may have friends that are starting to do it. Some of you may have done it yourself, you know, whatever. You're getting into that swing of things. But what's happening is, this is where it gets interesting. You ever walk down the street in, in uh, Austin, Texas, you'll see 12 gals walking around with all the same t-shirts, except for one, because she's the bride. And it's like, you know, Cindy's bachelor party, bachelor, what do you call it, bachelor, bridal shop, whatever you call it, bridal shop. Okay. So it's really about recognizing that this is something that's going on, and they'll spend every last nickel to be a part of that. I got married a couple years ago, and my wife's son, I call him my bonus child, his name is Jonathan. Jonathan, 26 years old, he comes up to me one day, 
I'm shocked he didn't text me this, but he came up to me and he says, hey, remember my friend Harry? I said, yeah, I remember Harry. I got the deli in the city, he lives in New York City. He's got the deli business with the family. Yeah, what about him? He says, oh, he's getting married. I said, hey, good for him. When's he getting married? 18 months from now. I'm like, oh, okay, very nice. Nice guy, I don't know. I said, all right, well, I hope, you know, wish him luck for me. And I start to walk away. He goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, what? He goes, well, aren't you going to ask me about the bachelor party? And I was like, oh, he's having a bachelor party. Good, good for him. Hope he has a good time. Okay. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. I said, what? He goes, it's in Iceland. I said, what? He goes, the bachelor party's in Iceland. I said, wow, when's that? Oh, next month. I went, what? He's not getting married for 18 months and he's going to Iceland. Now you guys are all going to Iceland? He goes, yeah. I said, all right, hey, have a good time. Wait, 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 wait. You know what's coming next, right? <laughs> Can you lend me the money to go? I gotta talk to your mother, I said. Oh, yeah. Anyway, it turns out, yeah, fine, no problem. You'll, you'll pay me back, like I'll ever see you. Okay. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Three weeks later, Jonathan comes up to me. I haven't spoken to him for three weeks. I don't know where he's been, whatever. Three weeks later, he comes up to me and he goes, hey, remember my friend Ali? I said, Ali? I said, yeah, I haven't heard about Ali in a long time. He goes, yeah, Ali's getting married. I said, oh, good man. When's he getting married? Two years from now? He goes, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> I said, well, you guys, when one goes, you all go. All right? So it's like a, a whole thing. So I said, all right, listen, I wish him luck. Tell him I say hi, and that's it. I start to walk. Wait, 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 wait. I'm an uh -oh. So I said, all right, listen, I'm not that. I said, so where's this bachelor party? First one was in Iceland. This one's in Amsterdam. So I said, when's that? Oh, three weeks after the other one. So I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I said, all right, well, I hope you have enough left over from the other one that you're going to be able to go on this one. Well, can you lend me the money for this one? You get the idea. I can go on and on. But what's happening is every last nickel that everybody had, they wouldn't miss this event for anything. So what's happening is this. When you think about what's happening in your work, you guys are absolutely steadfast focused on building memories, taking those pictures, making sure that you're part of what's happening, which is great. So the event, the experience is more important than even anything else. And you'll give up everything in its weight to be able to do it. So we're no longer building wardrobes. We're no longer buying things for the home. We're no longer buying things at the same priority that we used to before because of the experience. So we're not building wardrobes, we're building memories. That's a major change in the way in which we spend money. You need to think about how does that relate to the products and businesses that people have in the world today. We've changed our priorities from fashion number one, which was image, all right, to how we ate, to how we lived, and then where our future was. That's like saving money and debt and all that. That's what our priorities used to be. You guys now, your priority is about sharing, and most of that through social media, all right? That's where your image is. Your health is a healthy lifestyle, all right? So it's about how you eat and what you do. It's about investing how you live and what you do to entertain within that environment. And fashion, your image is, let, is down, the, down the line. So this priority shift has occurred. Retailers and brands have to learn how to adapt to that and change that. Because this is the brand you care most about. You're not interested in making another brand important. You're interested in making you important. And that's great. That's actually better. But it doesn't necessarily mean a brand can take advantage of that the way they used to. You're not running out to go endorse a whole brand. You're not going out and buying an outfit from head to toe in one brand. You're not going out and buying everything from one maker. All right? You're buying the best of the best, and you're willing to pay even more for some of the better things. And what's happening is brands are starting to materialize from places never seen before. You guys are responsible for creating brands that have started up from nowhere. And the internet has made and leveled the playing field. So all these big, huge behemoth brands now have competition from companies unknown before. All right? And what's happening is you guys like to discover brands and make them important. So it changes the whole dynamic. So if you just look at the mattress business, it's no longer about going to a mattress firm to buy a mattress. You'll buy a mattress online because you're going to be able to try it and you'll like it and goes back. That changed everything. So now all of a sudden they had to go out and create their own dynamic. 
Look at Warby Parker. We're all familiar with Warby Parker. $90 glasses, online opportunity to be able to buy it. Now they're even opening up stores. So it's the whole dynamic has changed in the way in which we live. Luxury being redefined in front of our eyes. Remember before I said how the handbag business stunk? Well, here's one of the biggest reasons why. How much does that Lululemon red tote bag cost? Zero. It doesn't cost you anything, as long as you buy a $120 pair of leggings. But that's the, become the new status symbol. It's not an LV bag, all right? It's not a Fuji or Chanel. It's that. And people are buying product in the store, keeping the bag and returning the product just so they can have that bag. That's how crazy it's gotten, all right? It's about understanding, you know, luxury changing in so many different ways. Go to a sporting event. Even that's changed. All right, let's keep going. It's about recognizing that luxury now isn't just buying product, it's about renting, it's about vintage, it's about you know, sharing it. All kinds of things have changed within the retail environment. This is very different for people that have been in the traditional businesses in the past. They've got to learn how to change that dynamic and understand what it's all about. Just, you know, if you can rent a fancy watch now, no wonder why Apple became the number one one. It's about looking at business from a very different set of eyes. Retailers and brands sit there and say, okay, we're going to look at which businesses are growing and which ones aren't. So if you're in the apparel business, the tops business, which are men's and women's tops, could be sweatshirts, shirts, whatever, tops business, is a $76 billion business in the U.S., the biggest apparel category of all. It's only growing at 1%. The bottoms business, which includes pants, skirts, shorts, all those things, all right? is growing at 1%, and that's the second biggest category within the industry. But what's growing is active bottoms, dresses, and jeans. So all the brands and manufacturers are saying, well, let's go focus on that and ignore the ones that are on the top because those aren't growing. But yet, here's the problem. The volume that you do because you're focused on these smaller upstart categories aren't generating enough to offset the losses or the lack of growth that's happening in the volume categories. So I call that leading to lagging. The leading volume categories are lagging in growth. All right? Now, when you look at the accessory business, remember before I said how bad it was? Well, that, they're not just lagging, they're going leading to bleeding. They're hemorrhaging. Why? Jewelry, their biggest category, down 4%. Bags, the second biggest category, down 8%. So they're sitting there saying, we're not going to focus on those things. We're going to keep doing the same old thing over and over again. And what's happening is they're not making up the volume nearly at, at all with the sm smaller businesses like small personal accessories like travel products and luggage, travel product and luggage. So what you have is these smaller businesses driving growth but nothing near what it's needed to do it. And I can show you this across the board in all kinds of businesses, whether it's footwear or whatever. So let's look at the beauty business, the one that's doing well, and see what are they doing that's different. Well, what they're doing that's different is they've got their volume categories that are generating business in all of them. And they rotate one to the next to the next. Makeup, as we look from today on, makeup is actually already starting to slow down again because it's been hot for a year. So they're creating all the new and exciting things to happen in the other categories. So now you've got skincare driving the growth. If I were to sit here, come back in six months and show you the numbers, you'd see skincare was driving the growth. All right? So it's really about understanding this happens in every different business. Now, I talked before about online and that whole thing about what's going on with Amazon and all that. Here's what's happened. Seven years ago, I wrote about this, and I didn't realize how big this was. I didn't realize really that this was going to change the way in which we think. I saw this trend, I call, and I wasn't going to name for it, I called it committed consumption. And I talked about those numbers that are on the left side. Things that happen before you go out the door on December 1st, there are people out there who have to make auto payments. They have loans that they have to pay. They have credit card debt, insurance, which by the way now is $220 because of the so-called Affordable Care Act. I want to get into the political discussion. But that number is actually dramatically grown, all right? 
gasoline, utility, you get the idea, cable, flow, you know. Uh, all these things that have started to happen that have changed the dynamic, all right? The average 35-year-old in the U.S. makes $35,000. The average 35-year-old. When you add up all of these committed items that are on the left-hand side times 12, it comes to, uh, uh, all that for the month, comes to $17,15, all right? When you take the tax out of that $35,000 income, it's $26,250. That $17,15 times 12, is 20,500. So your committed consumption, things that you've already committed to buy from your discretionary spending power is 20,000 out of the 26,000 that you make. All right? So that leaves you with $5,700, which comes to $479 a month, all right? Which turns out to be a little over $100 a week. Go out to dinner with your friends. Do it twice. You have nothing. You have no more money for the week. Right? So think about what we're talking about when it comes to this relationship of committed consumption. So now what's happening is our retailers out there are saying, well, how do we get in on this? Amazon wants you to buy things on subscription. So if you've ever bought anything from Prime, and let's say you bought shampoo and you had it delivered to your house, they're offering you the ability to be able to buy it on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. And it isn't just, you know, soap and shampoo. It's Fashion do. Now, Amazon, when they sell fashion from a brand, third party, they make commission. They don't make a lot of money on it. They make 2%. It's not a lot of money, but add it up, it becomes a big enough thing. What Amazon really wants to do is they want to make basics. They want to make private label products. They want to build something that you decide is important and sell it to you on subscription. That's where they're going to make all their money, all that margin. So why did Amazon buy Whole Foods? Amazon bought Whole Foods, not because it gave them a couple of stores that they could have a locker in, but not because they got into the grocery business, which, by the way, is the lowest retail margin business of all at 2%. So that wasn't why they did it. They did it because they recognized they had a high frequency opportunity of purchase. We buy food more than anything else. Highest frequency of shopping. They did it because when, when Whole Foods takes a good product, I just had Mexican food the other night, so I'm going to do salsa. Let's say they sell you that your favorite salsa is in Whole Foods, and you buy that branded product, and after a while they sit there and they say, wait a minute, this is now the number one selling brand. We're going to discontinue buying it from the brand, and we're going to make it ourselves and put it under the 365 brand. They're going to basically say it's the same thing, but they're going to sell it themselves so they can make big margin that way. Well, that's what Amazon wants. They want big margin. So they bought Whole Foods so they could be in the 365 brand and make big margin. Get it? So what's happening is all these brands now that are coming along and all these retailers have to kind of figure out how to compete with all these new brands and transition the existing brands, behemoth brands. Anybody right here with a company called Ralph Lauren? Right? Anybody even think about buying Ralph Lauren anymore? Yeah. Nobody does. It's, that's how a big brand like that, how did it drop out of the bottom like that so fast? Okay? It's kind of scary when you think about what's going on. But this is what's happening. It's all about brand transition and things that are happening. <coughs> Committed consumption by 2025 will be 30% of what you buy. So that means you're going to be spending and buying things all across the board in all of your expenses. One of my favorite examples is uh, the transition. Anybody familiar with egg McMuffins? Right? Do I? Do I? Do you ever, anybody have a deal with McGriddle? Is that right? Anybody ever have a McGriddle? Any good? I had the first time. One, I, had, I said, I can't come and talk to you guys if I don't have tried this. So I tried it at McGriddle the other day. It was actually really good. Shop. Never had it. All right. Why do I bring this up? Here's the perfect example of why you guys are so critical for brands and retailers today. This is what we can't do without you. Okay? McDonald's wasn't doing well for the last few years. And they did the dollar menu, and they did the, uh, well, actually, I'm going to share this with you in a second. Let me come back. They did the dollar menu. They did uh, healthy salads. 
They did, you know, the kids meal with the carrots. They, they, they tried all these different things that were going on. And the consumer kept saying, we want breakfast all day long. We like our egg and muffin. We like our McGriddle. Why do we have to, at 10.30, not be able to get it anymore? In fact, there was a movie with Michael Douglas called Falling Down. Right? Remember this? The guy came in at 10.32. He wanted his egg and muffin, and they told him no. And that just sent him off on a tiger. All right? But here's what I want you to see. McDonald's, McDonald's, this is McDonald's worldwide. They, they're not doing so well. How could they possibly not do great? Well, in fourth, you know, fourth quarter of 2013, look at their numbers. They started to tank. And people were dumping the stock. People were saying this company's lost all of its luster. It was competition beat them out. They have no idea what they're doing. Boom. And then all of a sudden, they went, all right, we give in. For years, they said, we will never do breakfast after 10.30. We will not do it, will not do it, will not do it. They finally did it. Look what happened. All of a sudden, their business jumped. It wasn't for any other reason. Not any other reason. They did all the other things during the downturn. All right? Well, my next question was, it took me a year to find this data. My next question was, do, how much breakfast do we really sell after 10.30? If that would save their business, let's figure it out. Well, if you look at this, what this shows you is that the vast majority of breakfast is served from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and a little bit into 10 and a little bit after 10.30. After 11 o'clock, nothing. So all the hype and all the hoopla and all the begging of McDonald's to sell breakfast after 11 o'clock meant nothing. But they changed their business. Why? Because they gave the consumer what the consumer wanted. We're not buying breakfast after 10.30, but we can. And that's all that matters. Okay? I mean, think about it. I'm not making any of this up. Okay? So when you think about what I'm trying to tell you, this is what brands don't know. McDonald's, the smartest people in the world when it comes to food, couldn't figure out how easy it was to just give us what we want, even if we don't want it. But we still think we do. Okay. So it's really about understanding what's happening in the market. I'm going to skip this because it's kind of, you guys already know this. All right. When you buy shoes, do you buy socks? Well, yeah, you might. But brands and retailers, they don't recognize that. They sit there and it's so logical, they don't get it. There's things called attachment rates. This is where we use receipts to understand what people buy in their basket at one time. The ability to be able to compare what do you buy at the same time you're buying something else. So what is it that I should carry or sell if I'm selling you this? What about that? They don't understand that. They don't do that. They don't do that. We do market basket analysis, but that's based on what gets bought, not based on what you desire. Retailers don't track what they didn't sell, they only track what they did sell. So basically, if I don't have something, how would I know I could have sold it? They don't. All right. Let's talk about what's happening in the world of retail. This is point of sale data from stores, not on the line. This is what's called a heat map. A heat map shows you which areas, which townships, okay, these are townships. Which township did well, did not do well, grew or didn't grow, okay? If you ask any retailer, where is the hottest area in retail? They'll give you five or six regions. They'll tell you New York, metropolitan area, they'll tell you Southern Florida, they'll tell you Chicago, they'll tell you, uh, it used to be Houston, now because of the hurricane it's changed, it's now Austin and Dallas, no longer Houston in there. And they'll tell you LA San, and San Diego, and they'll tell you San Francisco. And some might, if you ask Nordstrom, they'll throw in the Northwest, Seattle. But what's interesting is every one of those areas is either in orange or red, declining growth. So they're all sitting here telling us that retail hub of the US business comes from these five or six regions, but yet they're not growing at all. Where it is growing? North and South Carolina and Las Vegas, Nevada. That's where the growth is. So if you want to grow a brand or build a business, you've got to look very differently than what it is. This is why it's so critical for us to start to get brands and retailers to think differently. Using uh, receipts 
I'm going to share with you an opportunity to look at something new, the way in which we look at business. All right? This is Jen. Jen's fictitious. She's not real. But Jen is, a, a, is, is really a 22-year-old person, all right, who's shopping. And we're going to look at how she shopped. Her name's not Jen, but it's something else. And we look at her receipts that tell us all this stuff about Jen, okay? And if you look, this is where she shopped during the course of a year. A lot of different places. A lot of opportunity to be able to sit there and tap into what she did. On one given day, she shopped, all right, in the last, actually I said that wrong, in the last year, she shopped at Walmart uh, and bought different things from them over the course of the year. She bought some Faded Glory private label branded jeans, she bought some Levi's, and she bought some LEI uh, props, all right? When we look at what she did on one given day, here's her daily trip on one given day, you can sit there and see, uh, at, at 10 a.m. in the morning, she went to Kohl's. Then she went to Maurice's and bought something else. And then she went to Walmart and bought something completely different. So we can literally track who and where she went and understand how that dynamic plays out. This is how she did it and when she did it. All right? And it's about recognizing... Wait, went too far. It's about recognizing the ability to be able to tell a story and understand the consumer differently and better. This is the world in which we're going to have to start to live in. Helping retailers and brands figure out how and what we do that's uniquely different than before. Why did she shop at one place and not another? Why did she buy jeans in three places instead of just one? That kind of thing. All right. When we look at what's happening, anybody have to take a wild guess what this is? Unfair guess, because I'm not giving you enough information. What this is, is women in the workforce. We keep hearing how women have been driving, you know, a lot of the growth in retail and a lot of the driving growth. Here's women in the workforce. So when you think about what is going to happen with women participating in the workforce, if they're not working as much or they're part-time working, that changes discretionary spending power. That changes our buying behavior. That changes our ability to be able to shop and think in different ways. So we've got changes in the air, all right? So what I want you to start to think about is where are we heading? Where are we going? I threw a lot of different things at you, a lot of different ways that retail and brands have to rethink the equation. But it's really about recognizing that shopping today has literally become more about personal experience, the ability to customize the products, personalize the products, shop where and how you want, very differently than before, all right? That function, you would rather buy a product that does multiple of things rather than just look Right? You've proven that out over and over again. All right? It's about discovery. It's about more options. It's about all of these different things. These are the things that we kind of talked about. I'm not going to, you know, I expect you to memorize it. But it's really about understanding all these things are what's going on within the retail and brand community that they are just now starting to try to figure out. And they need help. They need you to be able to sit there and understand how to make that work. So when you look at where the opportunities lie, you guys already know more about this than we do. This is the difference in today's world and today's environment. All right? So with that, I'll kind of end it on that and get you to sit there and just start to think a little bit differently than you've thought before. The world has changed. Retail has to catch up to the consumer. And ultimately, to be successful, they have to get in front of the consumer. They need to lead the trends, not follow them. And that's why you become the most important part of the equation. Because we don't know it. We haven't figured it out. And we haven't figured it out yet, and we're going to need help figuring it out. All right? So, thank you very much.
So now what do we do? We're all selling jeans, we're all selling active, we're all selling sports, we're all selling, and it, it, it's so much a sea of sameness, like those, the, the slides that I showed of the shoes, right? All those things, that, that, that's a great example of similar product in a sea of sameness at $600 to $20. So the biggest challenge for the luxury market is to become relevant, unique, different, Make me feel that those New Balance shoes are worth $112. So the, the question was, at what point does luxury recognize they have to transition from living their business model based on heritage and brand art, the brand the art that the brand has to reach, and recognize that they have to earn it again with a whole new generation? That's where you guys come in. You guys are the ones who are going to help luxury either transition to that level or it's going to fade away. That's the route symbol. Anybody here really want to buy a route? I got a whole bunch of it at home. I'll send it to you. <laughs> Give me your address. I'm serious. I'll send you 50 folds. Okay. I've, I've never worn ever. <laughs> Write it down. I got it. What am I going to do with this? Okay? So it's really about recognizing, to your point, when does luxury recognize they have to transition? They have to transition now because they need to be able to grow their business through the next generation that's going to drive it. You guys may not necessarily have the big bucks in your wallet yet, but boy, oh boy, in the next few years you're going to. And if they're not recognizing that they need to address you now, you're going to be somewhere else. So Bonobos is a great example of the younger generation, the millennial generation, took Bonobos and put them on the map. Well, they got so big and commercially accepted, Walmart went out and bought them. Now, if most of you knew that Walmart owned you know, Bonobos, which you really find out, right? You might sit there and scratch your head and go, oh, well, why don't I want to buy Walmart? But Walmart's goal is to do exactly what you said. We want to buy luxury and acquaint ourselves. If you go to Walmart.com, you can now buy a product from Lord & Taylor. Because Walmart doesn't, doesn't want Walmart.com to look like Walmart. So they want to bring in luxury at an affordable price to transition the market. And is that going to work? Any of you going to buy Lord & Taylor product on Walmart.com? Anybody? I, I don't even want to. So what you have is the challenge of being able to get the brand to recognize heritage can only carry you so far. You now need to create a unique product that's worthy of the luxury brand extension that I'm trying to convey to you. Okay? Does that answer the question? Anybody?